All right, you're listening to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Today is September the 17th, 2017, so welcome to the show. Um, we're going to talk about some interesting things today, Stephen King movie and film and TV adaptations. Uh, but first, we're going to talk to Doug Wynn about his new book, Cthulhu Blues. So, hey, Doug, how's it going? Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me on. Let's do introductions, and then let's let's talk to Doug. Let's start over with Rick and work our way over. Rick Lay, uh, writer of Pulp Fiction and Pulp Criticism. Pete? Pete Rollock, Hurricane Survivor. <laughs> and we're glad you did. Matt? Matt Carpenter, editor of the future bestseller, Pickman's Gallery. Yeah, when's that coming out? <laughs> Maybe January? I don't know. Don't ask me these questions. It's too much pressure. Wait, Pickman's Gallery? That's not what I, I sold my story to. The email you sent me says, says Puckman's Gallery. Pickman, Puckman, what's the difference? <laughs> as long as it's right on the book, I guess. Right. Kelly? Uh, Kelly Young, executive editor, Strange Eons Magazine. Are there, I gotta ask you this, are there other editors at Strange Eons Magazine? Um, I am the executive editor. <laughs> that means he's executed <laughs> all the other ones. Uh, it used to be that there were a couple of editors, and uh, Rick has been promoted to editor in chief. I kept the executive editor title, and, and Rick then we Tillman, got, you mean? Yeah, Rick Tillman, and then we've got, you know, Justin Seal, fiction editor, so I basically sit just above Justin and make him do stuff. <laughs> it's it, it, All that power really seems to be going to your head, I think. That, yeah. There's some imagery there that I just don't like. <laughs> you like it. Hey, Justin. Pete never introduced himself, did he? <laughs> Pete did introduce himself, yes. Uh, you blinked. Uh, Evan. Uh, Evan said no. Cool dude. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Evan is a cool dude because he's one of those guys who are on the tier where they get to be on the show once a month. So thanks for that, Evan. Thanks for keeping the lights on. Also, and Evan Doug, looks like he lives in a black light poster. Yeah, it looks yeah. cool, doesn't it? He's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. <laughs> At least there's no bodily fluids on the walls. You know, just these are LED. Well, you're really going there today, aren't you? <laughs> Okay, Doug, why don't you introduce yourself? All right, uh, yeah, Doug Wynn, um, author of the uh, Lovecraftian Spectre Files trilogy with, with visual aids here. Uh, that's Red Equinox, Black January, and uh, just completed the trilogy this week with uh, Cthulhu Blues. That's the new one. Yeah, Cthulhu Blues. So it, it is a trilogy, so if if people are just hearing about you just now with that great title Cthulhu Blues they shouldn't start with Cthulhu Blues right they should start with Red Equinox right yeah it's uh you know with Black January the second book in the series it was still possible to tell a uh a story that worked as a standalone while tying into and picking up on the events of uh the first book Red Equinox but now by the time we get to book 3 uh, you you could kind of find your way through book three, but I, I do think it yeah it's time to uh, if you're gonna pick that up uh, probably start at the beginning with Red Equinox. You could all, you could always do a previously in this trilogy. This is what happened. Right, you know, you know I, I wrote in you know some scenes were written kind of as 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 elegantly as I could you know put in that backstory in the second book. Uh, the the recap kind of stuff without getting bogged down in it. I I did try to do that, but by now I, I think. If uh, if you're picking up this one, then then uh, hopefully you know what's going on in the series. All right. So talk about what the trilogy is, the the storyline, you know, without spoilers. Okay. Um, so, the Spectre Files takes place starting in 2019 in Boston, and uh, so it's a it's a near thriller apocalyptic story that involves a government agency called Spectra. And uh, there is a modern incarnation of the Church of Starry Wisdom in Boston. Um, a young member of that church who is an MIT student develops technology using uh, a hybrid of 3D printing and lab-grown uh, technology, uh, lab-grown cells to create this thing called the voice box of the gods. It's this larynx that can produce uh, harmonics that the human voice has lost the ability to chant 
uh, eons ago. So he's combining modern tech with ancient incantations to uh, bring back the great old ones. Um, the main character, Becca Phillips, is an urban explorer and photographer in uh, Boston. Boston has just been flooded by a hurricane. Uh, she's exploring abandoned buildings for really for her art to uh, to take infrared photography that that has this sort of haunting look to it uh, in these abandoned places. But in the process, she discovers fractal tentacles emerging into our reality from the dimension next door. That gets her caught between the cultists and uh, the government agency. And um, from there, uh, she, she continues to, uh, to be consulted by Spectra in book two. She gets involved in a, a very weird house called the Wade House, also in Massachusetts, uh, where the architecture shifts and, and where the, you know, the membrane between dimensions is porous. Uh, at that point, she also starts to learn about uh, something called the Invisible Symphony, which is uh, related to Eric Zahn, and, uh, and her family has a history of, of uh, keeping a manuscript of, of this piece of music and, and trying to unlock its secrets. Um, by the time we get to Cthulhu Blues, the musical themes are, are really at the forefront, and um, there is uh, an avatar of Nyarlathotep known as the Crimson Minstrel, who is... Um, trying to uh, recover this music and use it in conjunction with children born to witnesses of that first terror event. Their parents were exposed to the harmonics that opened up their perception to, to the entities. Uh, these kids have the ability to sing this music and uh, Becca finds that her own voice is mutating at that point as well. So uh, that's, uh, that's really the premise of, of Cthulhu Blues. Well, it sounds like really if you're a Lovecraftian, Lovecraftian fan, that you need to pick this up. And you're going to give away four copies of Cthulhu Blues, right? One print copy and three Kindle copies today. Right, yes. So l let me say this, because I've been so terrible lately with giving the email address at the end of the show. I think anybody who watches the show regularly knows what you're supposed to do if you want to be in the running for a prize. So I'm going to just give it up front. And uh, hopefully you're here for the show and not for the prizes, and the prizes are just a bonus. Uh, Lovecraft Ezine Prizes at gmail.com. So always put the title of the book that you're going for. So in this case, Cthulhu Blues, and we'll randomly pick somebody next week. If you're listening to this as a podcast later on in the week, after the 17th of September, 2017, uh, you can still get in on this up till the following Sunday. So Lovecraft Ezine Prizes at gmail.com. So anyway, yeah, um, and you've got a few other things out recently, don't you, Doug? Uh, yeah, you know, the, the book has been the, the main, uh, main thing I've been working on this year, but we did have earlier this year, I don't know, maybe some viewers have, have come across this, uh, Tales from yeah. the Miskatonic University Library. I, I was lucky to have a story in this. Uh, fun theme, this is from PS Publishing. And uh, it was all, you know, ideas of books that might exist in the Miskatonic Library. What's their history? What are their dangers? Um, so that was fun. Yeah, I got I, to write about they actually a, mentioned uh, the show uh, in the introduction. Did you did you notice that? They mentioned the Lovecraft Easy podcast in the introduction, which I thought was nice. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I hadn't caught that. <laughs> cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, fun, fun uh, anthology. I, I did a story about a book that... Um, there's a single copy of this book that roams the libraries of the world. So if you know what the call number is in the occult section of any library, you can see if it's manifesting in that particular library uh, that, that you're searching. So there are people who go around the world searching libraries to try to find this thing. Uh, if you do get your hands on it, what you find in its pages is, uh, is a reaction to your own psyche and, uh, and not necessarily something you want to find. But, um, but yeah, it was a fun one. And I, I think we have some more stuff brewing with, with PS Publishing uh, with, with, uh, these editors, Daryl Schweitzer and John Ashmead, uh, have some, some cool ideas on the horizon for other stuff. But uh, next month, I have... I Let me just say about PS Publishing, I've noticed that they're putting their a uh, lot of things on Kindle now, or at least I've noticed several books on Kindle. And they put them on Kindle Unlimited, which is really, really nice. I w I've been wanting this book of theirs called Scream Quietly, uh, the best stories of Charles L. Grant, or some a similar topic, but it's Scream Quietly. It's kind of the print's kind of expensive, and then I noticed it on Kindle the other day, Kindle Unlimited. So I'm reading it. 
So Ooh, I didn't. I didn't know those were were unlimited. That's great. Um, yeah, this, the book you just were talking. The book you have that story in is on Kindle Unlimited as well. So, so cool. just to comment. I've got a slide coming out. Yeah, Matt. I'd like to get the hardcover because they are beautiful books. But if yeah. you uh, need the budget version, Kindle's great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they they did a uh, a signed limited on this as well. I think PS does does those uh, fairly often. So it's also nice that you can read the Kindle and not you know worry about scuffing up uh, a limited book. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, the other anthology uh, that I'll plug while we're in plug mode, since you asked, is uh, <laughs> next month, uh, Shadows Over Main Street, which was edited by Doug Morano and uh, D. Alexander Ward uh, right. years ago. Uh, they're doing volume two of Shadows Over Main Street. Uh, I think Laird Barron is doing the introduction, and uh, we've got some great authors on board for that. I, I think Michael Weehunt is in that, uh, Damian... Uh, Angelica Walters. Um, so I've got a story in that as well uh, about a month from now. I'm looking forward to that one. You, but you said you're really here to talk about Stephen King, not not your books. Right. As so much as <laughs> someone else's work. Um, yeah. I mean, I could talk about Lovecraft all day. I had a lot of fun doing that at Necronomicon, but uh, I'm always happy to talk King. Yeah, it was amazing that whole time. I bumped into you just one time for five seconds, and that was it. In the freaking bathroom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everybody goes there eventually. <laughs> Our timing was off. Uh, so Kelly had a good idea. Well, uh, before you before you jump into that, can I ask Doug a question? No. All right. <laughs> yes. Hey, Douglas, so I am uh, embarrassed to say I have not read the Red Equinox trilogy, although all three of them are now sitting on my Kindle. But... Ooh. I loved the um, the Devil of Echo Lake, and now listening to this Cthulhu Blues summary, it sounds like music is pretty important to you. Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. You, are you a uh, are you a musician? Right. Yeah, you definitely identified a you know recurring theme in my stuff there. Um, Devil of Echo Lake was based. That's you know that's a non Lovecraftian novel. It's got a little more of an Arthur Machen influence, right? Uh, Great God Pan, but. Um, that, that was written based on experience uh, that I had working at a recording studio in the woods of upstate New York uh, at Woodstock, a uh, studio called Bearsville, which is now shut down. In fact, I think Neil Gaiman bought the property a few years ago and may still keep some recording studio capability there for, for Amanda Palmer. I don't know. But um, great, great environment, very, very uh, inspiring environment for a lot of artists and musicians over the years. Uh, but we would get artists coming up, like rap artists would come up from New York City, and, and they would be completely freaked out to be in the middle of the woods for maybe the first time ever. Uh, you know, like, are, are there bears? Uh, <laughs> so I, it just it made me realize that uh, out of your element, um, you know, a place like that, a, a secluded recording studio in the woods is a pretty creepy setting. There were even some stories about hauntings uh, there over the years since, since it was founded for Bob Dylan and the band back in the day. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I, you know, I... I was in a band for, for many years. I uh, studied music production and engineering at Berkeley College of Music and then, and then ended up working at that studio for a while before bailing out on the music business and just writing about, uh, about the music business as, as a sort of Faustian bargain tale. But uh, yeah, it continues to creep up in other, other books and stories of mine. Um, I, I think, you know, Tom Waits said music is uh, just interesting things to be doing with the air. And, and uh, I, I like how that kind of hints at, at what, a, what a little form of, of magic music is, that we're, we create these patterns in the air, these invisible shapes in the air that, uh, that open up you know, human emotion. And, uh, and so the, the overlay between music and the paranormal is something that's, that's really intriguing to me as a fiction writer. Uh, and that's certainly been a big theme in, in the Spectre Files trilogy, as well as some short stories. Yeah, I mean, it's a subgenre. The the horror rock and roll subgenre is a favorite of mine. And I wonder, as a musician, have you ever thought, while I was reading The Devil of Echo Lake, I kept thinking, I need a soundtrack for this. I did a Spotify playlist for The Devil of Echo Lake oh. uh, at the time. I, I'll try to dig out the link for you if it still exists. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, I definitely was listening to a lot of stuff at the time that I felt captured the mood of that book. So thanks. Very Scott. cool. All right, Mike, I'm done. Jeez. All right, God, jeez. <laughs> Asking questions that make sense. That's not really done on this show, you know. Certainly not by me. 
Well, you know, I, I will throw in one more one more bit of trivia about uh, Cthulhu Blue since we're on the music thing. Yeah. Um, I've featured architect architectural landmarks in all of these books. Um, they take place in Boston, so they're, well, largely in Boston. So uh, some, some Boston landmarks like the Christian Science Church and this building called the Maparium that has interesting acoustic properties that figured into the, the first book, Red Equinox. Um, but in the third book, I, I found this uh, architectural organ in Zadar, Croatia. There's this uh, C organ, which is, uh, it's, it's steps that lead down to the uh, Adriatic, where when the waves go into the chambers, it creates this really haunting set of chords by pushing air through, uh, through these pipes that are built into the, the concrete steps. They also have uh, a, a light show that's sort of a companion piece to that that represents the solar system. And it, it charges the solar cells during the day. Then at night, it, these sort of planetary disks light up with uh, different colors. Um, so, so my you know, evil choir of mutant children, of course, has to, <laughs> has to visit the sea organ uh, in the book. But, um, but yet yeah, it becomes a kind of a way of, of the, uh, the crimson minstrel getting feedback from Cthulhu from, you know, through the waves themselves uh, and, and creating this kind of musical dialogue. So that's just another, another musical, uh, you know, feature there. That's pretty cool. You know, I live in Seattle and we have a naval base here that has a bunch of pipes that are set up to catch the wind. And then it creates music as, as the wind blows. It's right off the coast and it is called a sound garden, which is where the band took its name from. Oh, cool. A little trivia for everybody out there. <laughs> Great band. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that. I'm done. Thank you very much. It was nice to be here. <laughs> yeah. Tip your waitress. Um, you know, before we... Kelly actually did have an idea of something we could talk about. Before we get to that, I do not want to sound like a commercial, but I just want to briefly talk about the cool things that we've had on the Patreon podcast lately. So if you're not a Patreon, the link's in the synopsis. Um, yes, Kelly had an idea, Matt. Um, the latest one was a discussion with Matt Carpenter about his favorite Lovecraftian stories. And I thought that was extremely interesting, Matt. So uh, we had that. Uh, if you want to know what those are, of course, you have to be a Patreon. So it's expensive, five bucks a month. A um, couple of other Lovecraftian tales podcasts and then Pete and Rick did one for me recently uh, Rick talks Rick, Rick talked about the Lovecraft circle and Pete talked about post Lovecraft authors so that was interesting as well and thanks guys for helping me with that so Kelly what it you wanted to talk about Stephen King adaptations yeah, I thought that since it has just, you know, been smashing records as a horror film release and uh, Stephen King has had kind of a storied career as far as adaptations go, that it might be kind of fun to touch on some of the other films that have either been successful or maybe not so successful that have been made out of his stories. And I wanted to add to that, it would be kind of fun to talk about a Stephen King's stories that have not been made into a film or TV adaptation that you would like to see made into one. So which one you want to talk about first, Kelly? I don't care. Oh, I think we could get into, you know, the adaptations first. Um, Cause I think it's really interesting. I, I went back after watching it, which I had some issues with, but I really enjoyed overall. Um, and I, I watched the miniseries of Salem's Lot, which I remember not particularly caring for, except for a couple of moments. And the this time, one, right? yeah, the TV series that Toby Hooper did, rest in peace. Um, and I was struck by how much I loved it as an adult and didn't think much of it as a kid. And I think probably because it's very slow but uh, he does a really nice job with the atmosphere in that. And yes, I love it. When I, when I look back, th there were some really great films up until a point, and I'm throwing out um, Stand By Me or The Shawshank Redemption or The Green Mile, which are just amazing films by themselves, and everybody agrees that they're great films. 
And mostly I'm talking about the stuff that um, we as horror geeks discuss, you know, late at night of what, what's a good movie and what's not. And I think right until you hit Christine, Christine is the turning point. And I love Christine, John Carpenter's adaptation of the novel, but it also feels very much like the point where things start to get a little weird in Stephen King adaptations. Because prior to that, we had Carrie, which I think is brilliant. We had The Shining, which I don't think is a great adaptation, but is a brilliant film. Uh, we had The Dead Zone. And then we get Christine. And I think it's pretty good, but then that's what kicks off Children of the Corn, and sometimes so, they come Silver back. Silver Bullet's in there, though. Silver Bullet is is not bad, but I it's thought it was pretty, pretty damn good. It's pretty cheesy. What is wrong with you? <laughs> I mean, Gary Busey plays a great crazy uncle, but we didn't realize he was just being typecast at the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> Dead Zone's definitely uh, one of my favorites. Yeah, the Dead Zone. Oh man, great one. Walking. Who who would have thought that Christopher Walken would make a good Stephen King character? But he's he's brilliant. So yeah, you know, and, and there's still the occasional good one. I thought Misery was a success. Misery, yeah. yeah. It seems like every time they've decided to treat the film with respect by giving it a serious, dramatic actor, it does pretty well. But when they try to switch it to uh, to teen horror or just you know, that 80s horror, which was uh, as fast as it can get pumped out, you know, graveyard shift, whatever, every single story in in uh, night shift had been optioned and they were just grabbing hold of those. And, you know, we got Children of the Corn, which is a fun movie, but by no means a good movie. Yeah, it's interesting that the most successful King adaptations are the ones that aren't really characteristic of his body of work, you know, like Shawshank Redemption. People don't even believe that that's a Stephen King story. He's talked about arguing with an old woman in the grocery store that, you know, she's like, I know who you are. You're, you write those horror stories. I don't, you know, I respect you, but I don't like that, what you do. You know, he's, he said, well, what do you like? She said, oh, well, I like that movie Shawshank Redemption. He said, I wrote that. And she wouldn't believe him. Yeah, uh, I remember that too. So, you know, it's, it's the horror stuff that's, that's outright full on horror that, that probably fails the most for him on the screen. But then you get it finally. We have a horror feature uh, that, that really succeeds, I think. I, I would yeah. just comment that um, it's not really a horror. It's just kind of like an interesting mystery. I really enjoyed Dolores Claiborne. I thought yeah, I didn't, really I didn't like that one, one but, but that then goes against what I was saying because they cast Kathy Bates in that, and right. she is amazing, but I didn't care for that. Now, that could also be I did not care for that novel. I never read the novel. I just, I enjoyed it as a movie, you know, as a film experience. I liked it. I'm a little bummed that Philip isn't here to chime in on this. Cause I know he's a King fan who's seen a lot of the movies and we have differing opinions on his stories and all that. But I know he's really looking forward to the Netflix movie of Gerald's game. That's coming out next month. Yeah. Which is by Mike, uh, directed by Mike Flanagan, the guy who did absentia. Absentia and Oculus and uh, what's the movie with the blind lady being stalked by this guy? Hush, hush, deaf. She's deaf. Hush, yeah, hush. Yeah, all good, all good movies. Hmm. I thought. Do you like? Did you like Oculus? For the most part, yeah. I loved to, the short. Not to film. off the subject, but. I love the short film of it when it came out. It kept playing at a lot of the same festivals we were playing at, so I kept seeing it. And I keep thinking that I got to meet him briefly at one of those festivals, but not enough to, to know anything about him. But I do remember really loving that idea. And if you haven't seen the short film, Oculus, it's a very Lovecraftian tale. Can we get back to the part where you don't like Silver Bullet? <laughs> I didn't say I didn't like it. I like it just fine. It's it's a little cheesy though. <laughs> yeah, but is that simply because it's a kids movie? It's a kids movie. Yeah. yeah, I don't I don't know. Well, it could be that Corey Haim, who is very good in that, brings a lot of baggage to a film. That's true. And so when you're watching it, you can't pull away from well, this is Corey Haim. 
Yeah. At least at least for me. I, I think that it's fine. I think the werewolf design in it is pretty great. I think uh I think that's Everett Mc, McGill or McGillis or something like that, playing the the priest who is the werewolf. Spoilers on a thirty year old film. But Yeah, the guy from Twin Peaks, right? Right. The guy from Twin Peaks, yeah. McGill, yeah. So very there, well cast in that role, I would yeah. I'd say. There's a lot I do like about it. Um but it's not up there as, as one of my favorites. Did you see the TV adaptation of Desperation? I did. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I let somebody else talk. What did, well, what did yeah, you I think tell about you this. I watched the trailer for that the other day on Amazon, and I thought, man, this looks like a huge pile of shit. <laughs> it didn't even bother. Well, you were wrong. You were wrong. I, I, was I? I, I thought Desperation was done very well. Yeah, I love okay. the book. Well, I haven't the, seen this. The trailer does it no justice, I guess. Yeah. That the, book, I felt, had one of the more satisfying endings of a King book from what I had read in that period of his work. Uh, so I'd be curious to look that up. And, and they kept the ending. Cool. The funny thing is that, you know, there are really good adaptions of Stephen King movies or books to movies that I think are great movies. And then there are adaptions of Stephen King books and stories that are awful movies that I simply adore. I cannot, like. I cannot walk away from Maximum Overdrive. <laughs> Directed by no less. It is a horrifically bad movie but I cannot walk away from it. By his own admission, King says that movie was fueled by cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it looks like it. It, it feels you know, like it. It's a wacky Radio movie. Shift. Radio Shift kind of is a little rough. Kind of unwatchable. You have the actors of Milo Estevez. Uh, I mean, you're just, what are you saying there, Joey? <laughs> I, I like Maximum Overdrive fine. In fact, I have a poster of Maximum Overdrive in the house. I think and it, I, I saw that movie in the or at the drive-in, actually, which was kind of the perfect place to see it. It is a great, fun movie. It's bad. And you realize whose face is on the uh, front of that truck or whatever it is. That's the Joker? Yeah. Well, no, it's the Green Joker. Goblin. It's oh, the, the Green Goblin. Goblin. Yeah, you're, yeah, right. Right. Before Spider-Man movies made it. Yes. Um, you know, Graveyard Shift. I. What can I say? I love Graveyard Shift. It's, that one I don't understand. That's just a bad, dumb movie. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, yeah. If you've ever had to, like, tear through an old building and crawl into a house... It gets all that claustrophobia and the, the things crawling all over it. It gets there. Um, you you talked about Salem's Lot, but the stand. Boy, I really loved that miniseries up until they decided to make a uh, flag. Um, I don't know. There was no reason for the bad CGI devil effects when right. he was a fairly – creepy person just in life right so I, I thought that that took away from it um i thought there was some interesting casting choices there there were there were some some that really worked i didn't like who they chose for flag that kind of undermined the whole thing for me in fact Can one of the only things it? that i felt was very successful about you know just for me the uh the new dark tower film was finally seeing matthew mcconaughey playing some version of randall flag i always felt like he embodied that character for me well yeah he was a yeah um dark tower that's just a shame that's it's a real shame yeah but philip pointed out something philip fracassi who's not here he pointed something out to me which was um well thank god it's at sony they have no problem just rebooting something completely in a couple of years and <laughs> saying sorry we we didn't mean that last one <laughs> <laughs> yeah we screwed that it was up. all the dream it was all a dream. Let us throw another billion dollars at it, see if we get it right. Well, yeah, Mike and I were talking earlier about how this has been a very uneven year for Stephen King adaptations because he had The Dark Tower, and then he had that Mist TV series, which was just awful. Then uh, It, which is, you know, 
pretty dang good. That Mr. Mercedes series that's on TV is is pretty good. So it's it's been you know an interesting year as a King fan, and I guess I guess my feeling now is why are we bothering to adapt an 800 page book into a 90 or 100 minute film when those things work fine as Netflix or HBO seasons. Absolutely. And let's let's just That's start writing cool. scripts for films now. You know, a 90 page script makes a, a wonderful 90 page movie and let's leave those longer form adaptations to to somebody who can do them justice. That being said with the mist at the forefront of my thoughts when I say that. Well, <laughs> some, some people can do it. Dome also really failing with that, you know, almost longer, it was a huge book, but uh, just really failing in what, season two of, of trying to serialize it. That's but true. On the, on the plus side of this, the uh, time travel story, 112263 on Hulu. Really yeah. good. Yeah. Well, and maybe the secret is we don't need to stick Stephen King's very adult, generally hard R-rated stuff onto ABC. Right. You know, which is why Under the Dome failed, I thought. Um, besides the bad writing, but I, I blame that bad writing on them not exactly knowing what to do to make this okay for their sponsors. Right. I, I, I mean, you make a good point, Kelly. You know, you know The Mist, first of all, I, I like the movie. I've watched it three times. I probably can't watch it again for a while. Um, the Mist is only a couple days, right? So... Right. It works fine as a movie because there's there's some very poignant scenes that work that you can string together as a film. And it's also a very short story. It's told right. in a short form. Right. But it, I think you're right. It, I think, would make a great series. And I think that the, you know, without giving spoilers away in the film, I think they missed the boat by turning this into two movies with the um, with the kids and then the adults. Because the way the book plays out is we meet them as adults first, and then it's kind of interwoven, uh, the, the memories of them being children and what they had to do. And that is so powerful. And, uh, it, you know, it's completely absent in the movie because we don't. We don't. Everything is told linearly in this first film. Did you like the It miniseries? Uh, no, no. I thought it was a shit show. To be honest, oh, I liked something. I liked the kids better, but the adults. I mean, the casting of the adults was something to be excited about, and then they all just phoned it in. They were awful. Harry Anderson and John Boy and. Tim Reed, who I fucking love, he was awful. Everybody was awful in that movie. I'm John tired Boy. of everybody telling me how great that miniseries was. Um, they need to watch it again and tell me that it's great. <laughs> Were you disappointed by the giant spider at the end? I was disappointed by everything. <laughs> uh, random question, Kelly. Do you like uh, Creepshow? Uh, I'm all right with it, I guess. <laughs> that, By the way, back there, that's autographed by... Um, for oh, those fuck. listening later, <laughs> there's a creep show poster behind Kelly's right shoulder. It's autographed by Adrian Barbeau. She says, Kelly, just call me Billy. And then it's also autographed by Tom Atkins. Um, and I can't remember what he wrote on it, but something about um, every boy needs a father or something like that. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of that yeah. film. Every boy it's needs a father. Uh, something about the the father thing. I've walked past that a million times, and I don't remember what he wrote to me on it. But he's got the um, he's the abusive father in the in between stories. I can't even remember it. Well, and then another little piece of trivia: the little boy who gets the um, the pins. It's Joe to, Hill. That's Joe Hill. Yeah, that's King's boy. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So I have Joe Hill. He signed it too, and he drew little devil horns on the boy. <laughs> hey, he should, he should write a book about horns. That would, that would that'd make a great book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Kelly, you're, you're very passionate about all this. You know damn well who makes it depends upon who's bought the rights and sees a cash cow. Yeah, absolutely. And There's no I sanity think to it. I think that we see that, though, um, and we're seeing it more. I think we see that the fans of the genre 
as kids grow up to be the creators of the genre as adults. And so the, the kids who loved um, Carrie and The Shining and everything grew up to be filmmakers also. And then they... And they Carrie too, The Rage. Well, you know, if that's, <laughs> if that's something they do, you know, then they should be beaten mercilessly. But a lot of them get into the horror field because they have a real passion for it but sure there's still filmmakers and creators out there who are are just there for a paycheck I, yeah i can't deny that did you tell me you're a huge fan of the tommy knockers me <laughs> you probably took uh i'm a big fan of tracy lords i have all of her early <laughs> movies but um yeah, you do. <laughs> really but, i'm the cops right now <laughs> Uh, no, I didn't love the Tommy Knockers, and that's the problem that I'm talking about. Is these miniseries get made, and they're put onto ABC. Um, Tommy Knockers has some pretty adult stuff going on in it, and so right off the bat, the creators know, well, we'll never let this get through. And and so my my question is, then why are we doing this? Especially the balance. Sorry, Doug, what? Sorry. Um, you know, you talked about focusing on just the kids in this first film for It, and uh, they say they're going to do the adult storyline next. And I, I can kind of see the studio pressures and the critical pressures involved in, like, okay, we've got this thousand-page book. How can we get people truly invested in these characters, connecting with these characters in two hours? Um, but then I'm hearing this week that where there was, and this is, I guess, part of the plan before, you know, fan reception and critical reception, they, they were... Director was saying his his plan for the Mike Hanlon character in film two is to make him a much more prominent character, kind of the the lead character in in defeating the monster. Uh, and people said, well, they took away his historian role. Uh, they gave it to Ben. It sounds like that's that's being restored, and and the cosmic angle of Pennywise is being explored more in this potential second film, which they're certainly going to make now with this huge box office success. Then I hear that they're talking about maybe even making a director's cut that takes both films and does the integration that you're talking about of the two timelines with a you know super strong home video market. It's it's the kind of thing that it didn't used to be even a viable possibility that you could remix things after the fact like that, but it you know just might happen. Uh, man, I would be thrilled about that, and and I love when they do stuff like that. When uh, when uh, why am I blanking on his name? Who did the mist? Um, right. Darabont, yeah. yeah. When Darabont released his black and white version of The Mist, I mean, yeah. you know, that's uh, arguably a better film, actually. And you know, we never would have seen anything like that before now. Well, so it's it's a pretty great time to be a, a fan of this stuff. What they seem to be planning to do with it reminds me of what Coppola did with The Godfather. Oh, he, the, he, he, he did a different version, but we did it. It went from flashbacks to linear. Yeah, so which, the opposite. I don't know if I, I don't know if I like that. You're talking like the six-hour cut that he did. Six-hour cut. Yeah, it I, was I got about. I mean, you, you, uh, I, I prefer the original versions, but it was an interesting take, though. I mean, it was. Yeah. It was successful as a variant version. And it's always it's always such such a it could go either way. I mean, I with the Lord of the Rings films, I could not get enough. Give me the twelve hour version, you know. <laughs> I kept yeah. buying every time they give give me more of that story. And then the Hobbit, my God, give me less. Right. <laughs> I, I was yeah. the director's yeah. cut. Yeah. The Hobbit should be like a, a one two hour movie. It would be the director's cut for the Hobbit. <laughs> yep, exactly. I'd buy that one. It's like I I can't I can't watch those again. I never even bought the disc. Yeah, yeah, I cannot yeah. watch The Hobbit again. I, Lord of the Rings, I, I have Great. that. Uh, I mean, I, I've only seen it twice, but I got the director's cut with all the extra stuff and loved it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's so that interesting. Was, that, that was an epic book. It, it deserved it. Uh, the Hobbit is a children's book. Shouldn't be the same length. Right. Uh, Pete, you had pulled out uh, the... Carry to the rage, <laughs> and <laughs> not in my research, <laughs> in my research, I had forgotten completely. So there's Carrie, which was brilliant. There was the remake of Carrie with Chloe uh, Moretz, 
Black. What am I? Some I can't remember her name, which was not as good. It was kind of a Harry Potter telling of Carrie, but um, I had forgotten that sandwiched between those was a ABC miniseries of Carrie. Do you remember that remake? Oh God. Um, yeah, I do vaguely. I think I drank. <laughs> as as opposed to, um, and I so I tried to wipe it out of my brain. It's interesting to me they keep going back, and not that they keep going back to the Stephen King well, because that's obviously a money maker, but um, that they keep going back to the same stories to remake them. As much as I love the Salem's Lot that I'm watching. I'm now going to go back and watch the remake of the miniseries. Do you remember that with Rob Lowe? Oh, yeah. 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 Well, was that the return to Salem's Lot? No, no that was a direct was a sequel. Oh, God. No, it, that was it, it had a, a different take on the priest. Okay. That was the main. And the monster, instead of being, I mean, the vampire didn't look like Nosferatu anymore. He talked and he was Wetker Howard. Which is more like he should have been, according to the original novel. Because remember, in the original novel, he was a suave, debonair man. Right. I, I like both of them. It's just that since I saw the the first miniseries and fell in love with it, I'll always prefer that. Yeah, yeah. me too. Me too. Uh, speaking I of didn't know what to expect when I saw that. Speaking of Salem's Lot, there's a very they made they made that into a very good audio drama. Um, oh, really? Yeah, I mean you have to Google it, but God, I can't remember. Was it ten episodes? Maybe something like that. But it was very well done and quite creepy in parts. Well, I'm writing that down. I need to hear that. What was that Stephen King I, tele television series that had a, uh, that adapted like about seven stories? Nightmares and Days. Nightmares and Dreamscapes got it right here. Yeah, that that is that was excellent. I, I was about to say I thought that was largely successful. That right, that ranks right up there with the Langoliers as the best. Wow, what a dick! <laughs> <laughs> but it's got. No. It's got a great Cthulhu Mythos story in there. It does. It does. Crouch in. Yeah, see, you're wrong, Kelly. I, that's just fine. I think the strongest episode of that was the first one, uh, Battleground, where was he fights the Army Men. Yeah, I thought that was a really excellent adaptation. You know, they've been very. That plot is very old. I I, I saw it. Uh, I saw a version of it on a show called. Um, Oh, I'm trying to remember. Games Dark Room was James Colbert, except that you know, it was so. This was about both stories deal with plastic soldiers coming alive. But when they did it in uh, the James Colbert version, they were just uh, humans, human actors miniaturized. You know, didn't look plastic, but they made them look plastic in the. Uh, Dreamscape, dreamscapes and nightmares, nightmares and dreamscapes. Yeah, and that I, if I recall correctly, there's no dialogue in that episode too, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, that, that was brilliantly done. Everything was done by just reading newspaper articles or uh, letters or whatever. And what exactly is your problem with Crouch End? Killing. Mine, I yeah. I didn't think it was a particularly strong story, but I also thought the Lovecraft elements um, were just kind of tossed in there, just just names that he threw in that you know could have been anything. I didn't feel it was a particularly Lovecraftian story. Yeah, and we talked about this before the show, and I'll repeat what I said. I that's not what made the story Lovecraftian to me. It was the thin places, other dimensions concept. Right. Um, that was the. Lovecraftian names were just icing on the cake. If you so. if you watch that and had no background in Lovecraft, you would still understand. It. Yeah. yeah, this is true. I'll so. bring up the audio angle again. Uh, Tim Curry read the audiobook version of that, and damn, it's excellent. It's really well done. He did a great job. 
Yeah, Pete. And so speaking of, of Lovecraftian uh, King stuff, uh, that story N, which was uh, adapted as sort of a, a multimedia graphic uh, sort of treatment, um, yeah. watch it on the web at one point. Uh, yeah. Love the story, but I, I felt it like it translated well into that medium too. Yeah. Yeah, I loved that one too. Pete, you were going to say something? Yeah, so we have about, you know, what is it? It's August, right? So we have about four more months. It's September. To, um, the Running Man, a reality. Because, you know, that's set in 2017. Some some would say The Running Man has been a reality for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, well, just for, for, for those, most of us are only familiar with the Schwarzenegger movie, but I read the book, and the book is quite different. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Once again, diverging from the source material. Now, this isn't exactly an adaptation, is it? Uh, Kingdom Hospital. He wrote the script for that. Do I have that right? Yeah, That's but a, he wrote that based on a was Norwegian, it a yeah. Swedish. Um, like yeah. Okay. That, that TV series was kind of rambling. Well, so I've actually seen the original, the right. Kingdom, Kingdom, and oh my god. That is fucking brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's, really. it's yeah. a really neat show. Yeah. The Scandinavian version you're talking about. Yeah. Is it in Scandinavian? It's subtitled? Or? Yeah, it's subtitled. Yeah. Okay. But it's worth seeking out and watching because uh, it's just awesome. Yeah, Mike, I know that you don't like to read or maybe can't. So I think there is a dubbed version also. No, I, I read. Yeah? I read, okay. books. read books, yeah, occasionally. Uh, and actually, I, I use. Thank you very much. I'm half deaf, so I use subtitles on the screen all the time. Oh, okay, I didn't mean to out you. They come in very handy. Oh, and the other fourth project that they've been teasing is this uh, Castle Rock series that J.J. Abrams is going to be producing. Oh it, yes. It, it looks like it's new stories that are tied into, you know, sort of trying to tie together all of the King, you know mythology into into some kind of a TV series, which is, is very interesting to me, especially with Abrams behind it. Yeah, and I had uh, hoped with Stranger oh, Things being so successful, it, it's clearly they, they know that there's a there's an audience for that. I've even heard people complaining that it is too much like Stranger Things. And I'm like, you can't call out, you know, the source material just because they changed it from the fifties to the eighties and, and put one of the same actors in it. It is one of my complaints about the It film is that it feels too much like Stranger Things because of the time shift. I, I don't think they should have done the time shift. I think that um, by doing that, you negate the horror that Mike went through as a kid. So I see. I, I would have thought you would be all for the 80s vibe thing going on again. I, I'll be honest. I mean, I love the 80s because I grew up in the 80s, but um, I love stories that are set in the 50s and 60s because I think it was a, a more magical time. So I think it's, it's for whatever reason, it's more easy. It's, it's more easy. It's easier for me to, um, to buy into a horror film set in the 60s or the 70s than it is in my lifetime. Hmm. What about why, why do you view it as a more magical era? The fifties is kind of stable, and the sixties is kind of turbulent. I don't know why. Uh, I'll, I mean, the short answer is because I didn't live in it, and so it seems like a more magical time. Right. Really, I thought you were older than that. <laughs> well, 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 Joe and I lived in it. Joe was here. Do, so. uh, do younger yeah. people see the eighties now as that sort of uh, in the mists of time bygone? Era. Oh God! I'm sure. Where anything could happen. <laughs> are, you, are you kidding? They see 9/11 is in the midst of time. Yeah, right. I did think it was interesting with this Castle Rock series coming up that the guy playing Pennywise in It has also been cast in Castle Rock, but not as the It character, which is a bummer because I was hoping that we were going to start seeing some kind of unified Stephen King universe. Right. But that is not going to be the case. Bummer. Can can we, without spoilers, can we just briefly talk about in the It movie? Was there any tie-ins to other Stephen King books, uh, movies, whatever? Oh, or, I don't. Can, can that even be discussed without spoilers? 
I don't think so. Are you looking for something in particular that you remember no. from the book? No, not at all. I was just curious. Yeah, I don't think so. Okay. I get a feeling I missed some Easter eggs along those lines, but nothing really overt comes to mind. Yeah. I don't think there was really much in the book. I mean, I know it's in dairy. Right. I know the turtle, who is sort of some cosmic entity mentioned in the book, has some ties to the Dark Tower, but... Yeah, it does. And the turtle is really downplayed in this installment. Yeah. Yeah. Lightly, yeah, there's some there's some imagery, but but that's about it. And I think when they're adults, there's sort of a uh, at least a homage to Christine in the book. That a car shows up that's sort of like Christine. Oh. I, I was, you know, this is sort of a little bit off track of the films, but um, in in the uh, Kennedy book, King really ties Derry and and the events of it. And, and I think he even brings yes. him to Beverly Marsh, right? Yeah. yeah he, he has him go to, uh, where did it take place? I'm sorry. Derry. Derry, right. Yeah, he has him go to Derry. I don't know if you guys remember. Well, you, well, you remember, Doug, but. It's, it's been a while, but I know, I know he, he spends a bit of time examining the, the evil that is Derry uh, in the 50s uh, when the character is kind of passing through that area. Um, yeah, and it does absolutely nothing to advance the main plot, but yeah. I loved it. Yeah. I did too. It would have been nice in the Hulu series if they had just done a little nod there so the fans could have gone, oh my God, those are the kids from It. Yeah. You know, it didn't yeah. have to be any of the actors, but if they had included that scene, it would have been a nice little nod for the fans. Uh, did all of you guys read From a Buick 8? Yeah. Yes, yeah. very good book. I loved it. Yeah, me too. Quite Lovecraftian, I thought. Um, I would love to see that made into a miniseries or a movie or something. Doesn't that tie in a little bit to Hearts in Atlantis, which they did uh, adapt? Yeah, I have not read Hearts in Atlantis. Uh, I think Lone, Lone Men in Yellow Coats, uh, one of the stories in Hearts in Atlantis. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're, 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 kind of kind of connects to Buick Aid, if I remember, it's been a while. It, it they, is they one of those connected. kind of cars, yeah. But, but they are connected, but the movie version of Hearts of Atlantis cut out all the Dark Tower stuff. Right. So it's like he, uh, Anthony Hopkins wasn't on the run from the Crimson King. He was on the run from uh, Taker Hoover. Right. I, I don't know, Mike. I don't know. That would take a real creative person to make that adaptation work. Yeah, it could but go the wrong scene, very easily. The scene is so static. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I do. do. What I would like to see adapted into film um, is Joyland. I think that would make a really good movie. Now that's one really I good. have sitting on the shelf and have not read. Uh, it's it's not supernatural except a very small hint of it. Uh, what it is is very a loving tribute to old time carnivals and uh, traveling shows and. Um, uh, also a tribute to growing up and a murder mystery a long uh, an old time murder mystery gets uncovered and investigated and I think it would make a great movie it, it yeah. works as a mystery yeah you can make that a single like two two and a half hour movie maybe even just a two hour movie and it would be really good yeah it's another example of him doing great work at kind of novella ish length just really tight story great voice that that book was everything I wanted Colorado Kid to be, but it wasn't. I like Colorado Kid. Too. Well, I like Joyland more. Well, Colorado Kid is you know he he, he you know it's a mis it's like reading a novel version of The Lady or the Tiger. You don't know how this resolves, and if it's going to be a novel like that, and you really have no hint of well. Maybe there are if you really read it. Yeah, Lady of the Tiger. I know she had the guy eaten by the tiger every time. I, I know. <laughs> what I was saying. Had the guy eaten by a tiger. I mean, it's like, go on. There's I was no saying, but in Colorado, kid, I mean, we have a mystery that's never solved. And I really don't have a clue after reading that what a solution could be. But look, Rick, I've, you... I've watched three seasons of Haven, and I still yeah. don't know what. 
what happened there. I tried to get into Haven and I couldn't. Yeah, and Haven is officially an adaptation of the Colorado Kid. Yeah, I just which makes no sense the because board. there's nothing of the story in it. <laughs> you can have some mysteries without solutions, but you have to have possibilities at least. At least a speculation. Yeah, that's well I can't, said. I can't see I can't see any hint of what happened in the Colorado Kid. No, they don't ever even bring up that mystery. So I was a little, you know, miffed. I gave it about four episodes and then gave up on it. You managed three more than me. You managed three more than me, too. <laughs> so I beat uh, you all. <laughs> well, what about if you had to pick one or two favorites? Um, I, I'd like to hear from everybody on this. Um, one or two favorite adaptations. And then after that, I want to talk about Stephen King books and or short stories that you would love to see adapted into a TV series or movie. I, I want to mention an original movie that he wrote. I can't think of the title, but I know Pete will remember it. The one was the cat people, the, the mother and the son. Sleepwalkers. Sleepwalkers. Sleepwalkers yeah. so that, I love that. With the lady from the, that, with the Borg lady, right? Yeah, the uh, lady yeah. was the Borg queen. Yeah, I can't agree with. I can't go with you on that. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're on your own there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love Sleepwalkers. You may you may not have cared for it, but I thought that was great. Well, are you saying that's one of your favorites, or did you get to that yet? Uh, it's one of my favorites. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, let's work our way over. Pete, give me a couple of favorites. Um, I asked, I kind of really love Children of the Corn. Mm -hmm. It's a, I, yeah. um, oddly enough, I like, um, he he came up with the idea. Other people wrote it. Uh, Rose Red. Um, which was a mini series, uh, based basically on a. A giant haunted house, kind of a remake of the haunted. Yeah, absolutely. Or of uh, of Matheson's Hell House. It felt very yeah, much really, like to absolutely. Me. It 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 it, had, it originally was based on a screen. He, he tried to adapt the haunting. I think for, for for whatever that movie was that Spielberg was involved with, and they rejected the screenplay, so he rewrote it as an original story. Um, I you know I really like that. That movie, um, I, the book is really good. Um, I've not seen it or read the book, so I'll have to check it, it out. You know, the funny thing is I'm not a big fan of haunted house films, but I could watch The Haunted, 13 Ghosts, the original, um, and Hell House and Rose Red all the time. Those are really good movies. I do love haunted movie. house films, especially older ones. <laughs> Thirteen Ghosts. Oh uh, come yeah. on! Just because it's so campy, right? It's it's a kids' movie, so yeah. I mean, it's supposed yeah. to be campy, but it's let's, it's pretty. Let's silly. not forget House on Haunted Hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another no, campy okay. Ghost on Haunted House movie. The Vincent yeah, Price yeah. version. And then um, you know. I think The Mist is a really good movie. I really enjoy it. I just can't watch it. Agreed. The last two yeah, minutes. I, I I think it's probably the the best Stephen King adaptation I've ever seen. But I'm not gonna. I can only watch it once. It's yeah. The ending. Right? I mean, that kills me. I just it, it's not, yeah. it's not it's, you know in the in the story. But uh, and I'm not and, saying and it's not powerful and effective. But it, you know. Yeah, but the thing is, I think that. It is powerful, but I think that the movie, me personally, I think that the movie would be better if it wasn't there. So it'd I certainly be more watchable. It, I mean, I love that movie, and you know, I fucking hate kids, but uh, that, <laughs> they don't that like end. you either. I just thought I'd tell you. Yeah, just, just so you know, Kelly, we took a vote. They don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's totally fine with me. But that end scene is too brutal for me. Yeah. Yep. The thing is. I thought The Mist, when I first saw it, was just kind of s silly because the creatures looked so fake. 
And then I saw the black and white version uh, when I was at the HP Lovecraft Film Festival in San Pedro. And I thought that made it a brilliant movie. It's weird that it's somehow better without color. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say something about the, the mist? It wasn't the ending that bothered me at all. It was the the female who's the radical kind of fundamentalist. Because I grew up kind of like in a holy roller church, which is not really why I'm an atheist now, but it probably put me towards that. I think that bothers me the most. Like when I watch her or her portrayal of that character, that definitely kind of alienates me a little bit more than the ending did. I know what you're talking about. I have a little bit of the same background, and she's dead on with that, you know, which is why it's it's so... Evan, you're well, saying that that alienates you because it's too close? Yeah. Yeah, that's, it's, it was for me. Some, Sorry, yeah, there was, some, for there was some stuff that happened as a kid with kind of growing up in that little that area that it was always like you know that fire and brimstone and stuff like that and uh her her there's a lady that uh i because i grew up in a small little town and there's a lady that was like that and uh definitely i could see if that's that happened in that little town the lady that was like the character would have been the one calling for sacrifices and all kinds of stuff so yeah Definitely was a some something there with that character for sure. Yeah, okay, she was pretty I, dead on. When I've seen that movie, I just want to punch the screen, you know. Like, so inter- oh, oh, I, find it, I find it interesting that we're all basically saying that this movie is hitting, you know, points for us that make yeah. us very disturbed. But those points are different depending on your position. Okay, and I would just say that. You say it's one of the most best adaptations of King, but the ending, as horrific as it was, gutted the Lovecraftian element that was present in the novella. And so for me, did it, was it like, did it make it stronger? What's I that? mean, if they, it, did it did it gut it, or did it make it a stronger yeah, it, well, Lovecraftian? The thing feel. is, that in the in the in the novella, there was no end. There was no hope. The mist continued. You see? Oh, because after that, we we then see that they're saved. Yes, it's like just another monster movie, and the U.S. Army is there. The yeah, good guys yeah. win, you know. Uh, yeah. That's okay, I can see that. Matt, what are a couple of your favorites? I mean, are you going to say the the mist, in black and white? Well, no, yeah, but mine are just they're so um, mainstream. I loved Stand by Me. Uh, when I saw it, when it came out, I saw it with some friends in the theater, and we just spent hours reminiscing about childhood after that. And I loved the Shawshank Redemption. It's a, it's a brilliant movie. Everything about it is just bloody brilliant. And I like Dolores Claiborne. So what you, you see from me is most of the Stephen King that I really like has not been supernatural at all. It's been his characters that come alive on the screen and the way uh, human nature and the way he draws relationships and circumstances. So when I say I want to see Joyland, which is you asked me what I want adapted, that's because again, it is not a supernatural kind of monster flick. So those are mine. Just I know they're very mainstream, but that's what I really like. That's fine. Yeah. Another movie in that category is Our Pupil, Non Supernatural, was yeah. Ian McKellen is the Nazi hiding out. Yeah. Yeah, and that's from the same novella collection, right? It's from just different seasons where we find Shawshank Redemption, too. Right. And The Body. Kelly, what do you want to list? Uh, well, obviously, I love Creep Show. Um, two of those stories were. Uh, originally written and published and then not collected, although I sent you the link for Weeds, which became The Lonesome Death of Jordy Verrill. And The Crate was written and published in, you know, one of the men's magazines back in the 70s that he was writing and sending to, but never collected, I don't think. And then the other three were written just for that film, but I love Creepshow unabashedly. And then... 
What did you think of Creep Show Two? Uh, I liked the one, the one middle sequence with the uh, the kids on the raft. Yeah, the raft. That's yeah. the only good thing about Creep Show Two. Yeah, and then I'm going to throw one out that's a little controversial. I, I've never been a George Romero fan except for his King adaptations, and I think the Dark Half is probably the best Stephen King adaptation. I I love that movie, and I think it's gritty and raw, and it feels exactly like the book did to me. Okay. What about you, Evan? Well, if I had to pick, if, if like I had a gun to my head, I guess I I watch. I would say I probably watched Salem's Lot, the 1979 version, probably close to 20 times a year. I'll listen to it when I sleep because it's just a. I love the soundtrack for that, especially that opening soundtrack. I love that. Um, it'd probably be Salem's Lot, Stephen King's It, the miniseries, and then uh, it's it's a tie between Silver Bullet and Pet Cemetery. But most likely it's going to probably fall to Pet Cemetery. I love Pet, or not? Excuse me, Pet Cemetery. Uh, Silver Bullet. I love Silver Bullet. I love like I. I know I know Corey Haim and the two Corys and all that crap. But like I, you know, as I grew up, I'm only going to be 32 this year, so I didn't really have that stigma as like I guess you all would have with the the dude who played uh, the main character in like Salem's Lot. I remember like reading that people didn't really like him because he was what from Starchy. Star Starsky and Hutch or something like that. Yeah, oh, yeah. and I, I really don't have that connection towards those characters. So if I, I to be honest, it's what scared me as a kid. And Salem's Lot, I, I remember being in my grandparents' house watching that, and uh, it was already creepy as it was in that house. And when the kids over there like doing that, that just scared the shit out of me. That's interesting that you mentioned that, Evan, because that's the single curious scene that my wife um, remembers from any horror movie that scares the hell out of her. We're tap, yeah. tap, tap. To this day, I can say the words tap, 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 and she whoops around. <laughs> like, that so. scared, yeah, that scared me. And then I remember the first time I saw the miniseries for It, I was 10 or 11. And uh, the part where he goes in and sees Eddie in the shower scene, and he's like talking to Eddie, and he like rips open the the thing. I couldn't take a shower, like a good shower, a good shower for like two weeks after I saw that. <laughs> I don't know what it was about that that just really scared me. But I was also scared of clowns when I was a kid. So <laughs> no, I'm not scared of clowns anymore. Nothing scares me these days. But uh, yeah, those three movies probably Silver Bullet. I love Silver Bullet. I love Werewolf. They don't make enough werewolf movies, so I watch Silver Bullet every um, Fourth of July because that just fits perfect with that. Uh, and the book's amazing too, Cycle of the Werewolf. But uh, yeah, I love those. And if I had a pick, are we doing the picking or the movies? Uh, not yet. We'll get back. Okay, to okay, that. okay. Yeah, those are my three. All right. What What about you, Doug? Um, for for me, you know, Shawshank Redemption. Stand by me. Those those are are sort of an, another class. I think they are better films uh, than the body of his work. But uh, you know, as as translated to film. But uh, but if I'm going to go for things that that feel classic King to me and that have both the character development and the supernatural aspect, it it is Green Mile, Dead Zone, and this new adaptation of it. Uh, I, I have a soft spot though for a lesser. Uh, <laughs> Uh, production, the Storm of the Century miniseries that they did, that for me that worked. Yeah, that, uh, maybe that, that it was, was a screenplay good. instead of yeah. a, a story. Um, but if I was going to, if you know things that I would like to see adapted that haven't been, uh, first thing that comes to mind for me is Revival. Um, that was a book that I felt got deep into character and and showed a character over the course of his lifetime and it had a strong Lovecraftian element and, and some things that would be really cool to see on the screen. So uh, that would be I'll awesome. say, but, but really also, strong Lovecraftian element. Was The Long Walk ever adapted in any way? If it was, I missed it. That's, if not, No, but like, man, yeah. that needs to be done. 
And that, you know, long, that stuff, that apocalyptic stuff. Did I miss that one? I think I missed that one. What's that I'm, about? I'm saying it was I, a Bachman imagine, book. I can't even keep track anymore yeah. of, of all the King adaptations that are out there in some form. Uh, if that hasn't been done, it should be. I mean, all the apocalyptic, you know, if you look at the success of things like Hunger Games, it, it's insane that no one has, has done the long walk yet. They have not. Mike, I sent you a trailer that I think was a, uh, I don't know if it was a fake trailer or if it was just an animated trailer for something that somebody was going to try and do of the long walk because i thought you might be interested in it. and this is probably about a year ago um yeah i might not have seen it i've got you filtered to go to trash <laughs> <laughs> i can't believe i laughed at that you son of a bitch <laughs> uh so yeah all right so i will go with i mean i, I have a feeling i'm gonna like it but i haven't seen it yet um, I'm going to go with Crouch End. It was one of my favorites. And I have to go back and agree with several of you on Salem's Lot. That's just the uh, 1979 Salem's Lot. It's just very well done for me. Uh, atmosphere and the moods is great. Um, so as far as a story, and then we'll get to the rest of you guys, what you'd like to see adapted. I would say I'm a big fan of Miss, Mrs. Shot, Mrs. Todd's Shortcut, and I would love to see that made into uh, an episode of, say, something like Nightmares and Dreamscapes, you know, for example. It's just got that Twilight Zone type feel. Right. So what about you, Rick? What would you like to see adapted? Well, well, since I like the film version of Desperation, I want to see the alternate storyline which was The Regulators, which was a Bachman book, which has the same characters in a totally different situation. It's an alternate history version of Desperation. Okay. Anything else? No? What about you, Pete? You're muted. There you go. Yeah, I, I'm thinking. Um, you know, maybe the jaunt. Oh yeah, the teleport yeah. story. Yeah, and uh, I am the doorway. So I am the doorway is being made right now as an independent film. Is it? Yeah, it yeah. is. <laughs> Okay. So I'm looking. I'm looking forward to that. It looks like they got a couple of bucks, and you know, King has done this really cool thing where he will sell his options for a film to student filmmakers for a dollar, providing that they don't turn around and try and make money off of the film. And so it's a good way for them to get into film festivals with a Stephen King film and stuff like that. So I'm really looking forward to to seeing what these guys do with I Am the Doorway. You know, I gotta say, I don't know Stephen King, but he absolutely does not sound like a dick. He sounds like a really nice guy. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, I think it. In some cases, he's a really nice guy who sometimes has been pushed into into hard places by rabid fans or sure. rabid people out to make a buck. I'm sure. Yeah. So yeah. yeah um, is it? Uh, I am the doorway. The jaunt. Um. I kind of like, is it gray matter with the beer? Yeah, that's right. I, I kind of like that story because, you know, we all we all know that guy who sends his kid out to get beer, right? I mean, yeah. I can remember when I was a kid, we, my, da, my mom and dad would give me 20 bucks and I would have to take the, the, the little red wagon down to the 7-Eleven. I would get milk, bread, and a carton of cigarettes. <laughs> you know, but... I know that there's, you know, there are guys who send their kids out for beer. And you know, there was one one movie I forgot to mention. Sure. The the Night Flyer. Yeah. The Vampire. Miguel Ferrer is excellent in that film. Yeah. And did uh, did they or did they not make Popsy? Uh, the same I don't think they did. Right. I have seen a French. Uh, low budget version of it, indie version of it that is very good. They gender swap it, so Popsy is actually Momsy or something. Okay. <laughs> but but Gramsci. it's uh, it's <laughs> it's very good. All right, okay. So that's where I'm at. All right. Well, what about you, Matt? Uh, 
Any any stories come to mind that you'd like to see adapted? Yeah, no, you have to forgive me. I don't remember the names. I read a, a few of his short story collections recently, and I thought these could be effective movies. Uh, there's one where a guy has a rival over real estate or something, and he gets uh, locked in the bottom of a toilet of a porta potty. Remember that one? Yeah, I remember, I remember which story movie. you're talking about. Yeah, I can't remember the title. Uh, and then that is, that is the grossest story ever, and I can't remember the title either. But it's it, hilarious, it Very effective. You know, the, it, I could just see him. It, you give this to two uh, actors who could just chew up the scenery, and and you could make that into a really compelling movie. Because the other yeah. movie I thought would be pretty good adapted to a film would be that there's this uh, lady who. Uh, runs every day as a means of working out her pain uh, over her divorce and then she really gets into it and then she's really in great physical condition and, and then she uh, ends up getting running afoul of like one of her neighbors is killing young ladies and she ends up sort of getting caught by him and getting into a race with him do you remember that one the the, the is, porta -potty is a very tight What's that? Gingerbread girl or something? It, it's like, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, I don't remember what they're called. Sorry. I just, I don't remember that one, but I remember an, another story with the running theme where a guy's running and he, on, he's running on a, um, yeah, what the hell do you call those things? My mind's blanking today. Sure, I think you're thinking of stationary Treadmill. bike one. Stationary bike. Yes. Thank you. Um, that was a good story. Yeah, see, this one is like, yeah. it's, again, this woman is like, uh, her marriage is broken up or whatever, and she is into running, and she gradually sees that uh, this guy brings a new young girl down to stay in some area of Florida every season, and she starts to wonder about it, and she gets caught up in it somehow. All right, so that's the gingerbread girl. Yes, yes, yes. And the porta potty is a very tight place. Okay, I thought both of those could probably make decent movies. You know, hour what, and a half. What collection are those from? Isn't that everything's eventual? Just after, after, after sunset. Oh, is just it okay. after just after sunset? Just after yeah. sunset. Yeah. Yeah. I love that Douglas said "gingerbread girl" a million minutes ago, and we've all been trying to figure it out. <laughs> Pete says yeah. it, and that's like yes. <laughs> well, I was like. I'm trying to break in, and it's like, you know, I know the names of the stories. You just got to. I wasn't sure, but Pete has more credibility than me around here. I do? I, would, I wouldn't say I would, that, really. No, yeah, not really. That's, you've never said anything more wrong. <laughs> I, I forgot to mention N, which is one of my favorite Stephen King stories. I'd love to see that made made right into a movie. And uh, it, I think that would make a very cool movie. I think it would be easily done, too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Kelly, you're up. Uh, I'm going to go obvious as a Lovecraft fan. I would love to see Jerusalem's Lot made. I think that, that that was the story that got me into Lovecraft without even realizing it. I was a Stephen King fan before a Lovecraft fan, and when I read that and then read something about it saying that it was an homage to Lovecraft, I was like, well, who is this guy? And I think it's a cool rats in the wall kind of story, and that, that's my favorite Lovecraft story. So I'd really love to see that done. And then um, I've spoken with Eric Morgret, my my partner in the filmmaking stuff, a million times about maybe optioning Uncle Otto's truck. Do you remember this one about the the kid who's talking about his uncle who basically just sits there every day and the truck and the long grass that keeps getting closer and closer to the house. And then they find his uncle dead with spark plugs and oil in his mouth and all that. Uh, there's just something weird about that. I, I love King's books that have zero explanation to what's going on, like the, the finger in the drain story and stuff like that. Um, in fact, in that story, uh, I remember, I think it's that very story where, the character says, why do bad things happen to good people? Right. And then somebody else answers, don't ask. Right. Right. I, I've, I love King best when he's riffing on Matheson or Bradbury. And this feels like a very Bradbury story to me. So, Evan, you got, 
Evan, you got one or two? Uh, sorry, I tried to mute it. Uh, yeah, actually, you know, out of his new book, uh, Bizarre Bad Dreams, excuse me, the new and. Uh, anthology but um there was two actually i can't remember the first one but i believe it's the first story and it's about a um a little boy who goes and breaks into this like diner abandoned diner and these cars keep pulling like up and uh i guess something to do with the car one of the car is actually a creature that eats people i don't know if you've read that one it's actually pretty good mm -hmm. But then there's another one. Hold on, my cat's being a pest. Uh, there's another one that is called Bad Little Kid. And uh, that one is about a little boy who torments this kid who grows up to be an adult. But the little boy is like this ginger kid with one of those spinny propeller hats back like in the 50s. And are Dennis the Menace style kids. And he never ages, but he's always there to... Uh, kind of be the devil figure of this man until this man eventually ends up killing him goes to jail because it starts off in jail and stuff but it's just the way uh king describes the kid as like the the thing that it's obviously some some type of like creature or something because he says that the the little ginger kid is uh, no offense to gingers but a little <laughs> that's how he describes them in the book that's so how dare you like, <laughs> He says the little kid unbelievable looks like he's um there's something stuffed in him like it's a suit and the suit's like just trying to like almost break a little bit. I would really you know I'd like that to be actually that'd be a really good like short like short little film or something or maybe even a longer one. But actually like for a full movie I would love for them and I you know I I'm I'm kind of I always bitch on remakes and stuff but I would now that the new it movie came out and even though he Pennywise didn't use the name Robert Gray yet I would like them to go remake a uh, Dreamcatcher and actually connect the two character you know Robert Gray and Pennywise together since they're technically the same character so um yeah that's probably the the one I would like to be re remade if anything is the Dreamcatcher film all right was yeah. the first one you mentioned uh, Milepost eighty one? Does that sound right? I don't. I th it might be. Um, it was in the newest book. Did you read Bizarre Bad Dreams? I didn't, but I read this one as a single, so it, it could have ended it up could, in there. It could have been because uh, the bad little kid was actually a, and it's weird this story, but it was a a, a story that he wrote for a French magazine. Back in the like, I don't know if it was in the '90s or something that just now got translated to English, which I don't understand that. But uh, yeah, so it could have been that. Just, just an FYI, we is not really a French magazine. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Doug, what about you? Sorry, finding the mute button. Uh... Uh, you know, a story that's that's coming to mind as as we have the conversation is. Uh... This um, the the title story in Everything's Eventual. I don't know if you guys have, have read that collection, but um, it's it's just this really cool uh, sort of a cult almost sci-fi story about this this kid who has a psychic power. He can he can kill people by drawing these weird sigils, these diagrams, and and this uh, this shadowy organization employs him and uh, sets him up with a house and, and they give him a stipend to live on and he has to dump uh, any extra money he has at the end of the week he has to like dump it down the sewer drain <laughs> I guess for Pennywise uh, no just so that he doesn't have surplus income so that he doesn't have any freedom to actually go out and uh, and and live beyond the the control of, of the organization that's that's harnessing him for this um, but they have him you know he logs onto a computer every day and he, he draws these symbols that are then used to uh, to, to take people out uh really really cool story uh that that i think would make an interesting movie that could probably be expanded beyond the parameters of the short story i think they're tied into hearts of atlantis that the organization was employing the psychics was uh, that sounds familiar yeah when they was chasing after uh, the anthony hopkins character okay yeah 
All right. Well, good discussion on Stephen King adaptations. Uh, Wait, Mike. Mike, you haven't told us what story you might want to see adapted besides from a view of eight. No, I did. I said N and um, what was the other story I said? Uh, Mrs. Todd's Shortcut. Uh, yeah, Matt. Fuck. Wake up. No. <laughs> He's just very interested in what I have to say. And you know, who can blame him? You know. Uh, I, and that life was 99 cents to rent on Amazon yesterday, so I finally watched it last night. What did you What did you guys think of life? Because I, I don't think I was impressed. Really? Oh, I liked it a lot. Uh, I thought it was um, I thought it was a much better alien movie than Covenant was. <laughs> I didn't watch Covenant. So I will agree with you there, except I hated the ending. I hated of the life? ending too. Yeah. Was it, it only it makes because absolutely no sense? It doesn't make any sense at all. Was it only because you were able to figure it out? And what was supposed to be a shock ending was very apparent as soon as they yeah. started that scene. Yeah. No, that's not why I didn't like it. Oh, okay. I didn't like it because it de mechanically doesn't make sense how that happened. They're each piloting their own little pod. So how does w one end up in the wrong place? And how do both of them end up in the wrong place? Doesn't make sense at all. Did you fall asleep at some point? Did you do Maybe. a little mic micro sleep because they ex they they showed the scene? That's why the rest of us were able to go. Oh, of course they're heading in the wrong. Direction. Maybe I missed it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, give me a break. I was in the ER a day and a half ago. So. <laughs> I I like the movie. I also like seeing really good actors in horror films. Um, because I think that's good for the genre, and. I loved the Lovecraft reference about four minutes oh, yeah. in. Yeah. Pete, Pete probably really loved it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, no, mm -hmm. I thought it was a good movie. I find it very interesting the way they did it. Um, I just did not like the ending. And it just seemed almost forced. What well, was the Lovecraft reference? And so I probably won't see the movie. Uh, it was a reference to Reanimator. Yeah. He said something like, "This is some kind of Reanimator shit." Oh, okay. So. Yeah, but when Ryan Reynolds is name checking a, a Lovecraft character in a big budget Hollywood movie, you know, yeah, we've arrived. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Deadpool mentioned it. We're good, right? <laughs> Uh, there's a GoFundMe for a uh, anthology that looks interesting. It's called Test Patterns. Yes. Uh, I'm glad you brought it up. Thank Cause, you. Because um, why? Because I have a story in it. The concept, a collection of short speculative, speculative fictions written with classic television shows such as The Outer Limits, The Twilight Zone, and The Night Gallery in mind. I don't know. That sounds pretty interesting to me. Yeah. If you Google test patterns and go, go fund me, I imagine you'll come to it. Yeah. I was out with uh, Nick Gucker not too long ago, and every time we go out, he pulls out this portfolio of art to show me, and he showed me the cover for that. And I was just like, what? How come I didn't get this for the magazine? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I... He gives you the trunk stuff. Yeah, it's awesome. All of his stuff, yeah. Everything I've gotten from him is just toilet stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't think he has trunk art. I don't think so either. Uh, all right, so Doug is giving away four copies of Cthulhu Blues, one print, and three uh, three Kindle. So again, Lovecraft Easing Prizes at gmail.com. Put the subject of the book in the – put the – title of the book in the subject something like that so all right do we have anything else to cover before we adjourn anything else we need to bring up i don't no? think so just, just patterns looking oh you know one, one last thing i saw the innkeepers about a week ago you guys see that yeah is that the two the, the couple looking for ghosts in the yeah okay yeah, it's it's a little slow, but it, it kept sucking me in. Yeah. I you know, and it, I didn't yeah. love it, 
But um, the same guy made um, House of the Devil. And I don't yeah. know if you've seen that one, but it, it's got the same yeah. feel. And, and I really did like House of the Devil. So I'm, I'm in the middle of Death Song right now. This big... Is it a dark song? song? A dark is it song? Dark, dark, dark song. song? I saw a preview of that earlier. It looked, looked really interesting. Is that yeah, the, um, it's, it's definitely intense. I haven't figured out what it's about yet. So That's on Netflix, right? right. Yes. Instant. I'm going to look that up. So, and I, I mean, think, I, I know, you know, basically, you know, this woman is trying to contact her dead child, and she's going to perform a ritual, but... Um, it's kind of interesting that they're doing this. It's a ritual is very complicated. It takes weeks, if not months. And uh, there's some ulterior motives that's, that are apparent, but we don't know what they are yet. So and it's called Dark Song? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Dark Song. It, it reminds me of a Richard Matheson story that was adapted twice for by Dan Curtis. Okay. Once for a trilogy of Terror 2 and... Uh, it was uh, it, Dead of Night. Two anthology films, Dan Curtis did he have a story like that that Richard Masterson wrote. It was a two-character drama. A woman brings back her dead son. Hmm. And I, if I remember correctly, The Innkeepers is free to watch if you have Amazon Prime. I think it's on Amazon Prime. So, streaming. Did anybody else check out the Death Note film on Netflix? Oh, oh, I can't because my son loves that anime, and he's off at Wisconsin. So I'm kind of saving that for when he comes home for Thanksgiving. Uh, my son loves that anime, too. Uh, oh, okay. I'm curious watched. to hear what, well, what people I know. I love the live-action Japanese version. Uh, 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 Laird, said that the, Laird said to me that uh, the... Um, the movie was not good if you've seen the anime. Yeah, don't. Something to that effect. Don't. I've not seen the anime, but I'm also an adult. Well, you know. well the anime. The, well, Come on. I don't, I don't want to be. We know. <laughs> look, what, what? What about? I I'm, I'm assume you watch DC animation. No, you assume wrong. I'm I'm an adult male, and I don't read comic oh. books or watch cartoons. <laughs> I don't blame you on the comic book. <laughs> The joke is I read comic books and watch cartoons constantly. <laughs> okay, there De you go. Death Note, the anime is on Netflix, but I'm, I'm just, I love the the anime. I've seen it like multiple times all the way through. That don't, I don't know how anybody can watch even the Japanese live action films and be like, oh, this is such good, you know, speaking, watching the anime, the anime is just too damn good. I mean, it's like it's the best detective story. Just the idea of everything. It's it's just a great because the the supernatural stuff's not even in the forefront. It's in the background. The rest is is the detective story. The, the yeah, my new, son spent ten minutes talking to me about it the other day. He really loves it. Yeah, the well, the Netflix Evan abomination was horrible. Have you read the manga that the anime is based on? Yeah, actually, I have, and there's a, that was. That was quite different. I heard also. Yeah, there's the manga always is a little different because they because they're long. I mean, it's it's well, technically it's twelve books, but it's thirteen. It has an extra like um, encyclopedia, for you say, for each character, what was going on, all the little things. So yeah, it's a little different and stuff. But uh, the live action films, they even have a uh, I think they have a Death Note musical in Japan, actually, uh, but. The, the live action, even the Japanese version, the, it's just they're horrible. You, I don't. Live action anime is always horrible. To be honest, it's hard to do live action anime. All that being said, I I was totally fine with the Death Note movie. <laughs> the new one? I haven't seen. Or I've seen it, but I was like not. I haven't seen the Japanese ones in a while, so I can't com really compare the new one. But ugh, I didn't like the new one. Yeah. All right. Well, Doug, thanks for being here. Hey, thanks uh, so much for the chat, guys. Okay. Great to see you again, Doug. And um, thanks to everybody who listens to the show every week and being part of our little group here. And a special thanks to everybody who donates to the Patreon and keeps the lights on at my house and keeps the Lovecraft easy and going. We'll have uh, Oren Gray with us next week, and we will talk to you then. Thanks a lot. <laughs>